Good morning. And welcome to Connors Hill and Sherd Park as well. If you're new with us, we are going through the book of John over uh, this current sort of school year and next school year, taking the long view. And diving into some familiar topics today, but some new topics. But at the core of today's passage is this idea of truth. And the connection in the place of truth between knowing what is actually going on in our world and in our lives on the one hand, but again, deeply connected to that, knowing how to make great decisions. How do you know what is true? And how do you make decisions based on what is true? And the beautiful thing about our society is we each get to decide what we want to be true. Amen? I mean, but it is kind of handy. A number of weeks ago, I uh, planted some grass seed. And if you read the back of a grass seed bag, there's a lot of words, but it essentially says, like, water, 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 water. And so I was like, well, I could water, but how much cooler would it be if it was going to rain for a few days? So I flipped open to the uh, weather app, and it wasn't going to rain. Uh, but it doesn't matter, right? Because you just keep picking a different weather app. And eventually I got one where it's going to rain. I'm like, cool, I don't have to water. And sure enough, it, it rained for, for two to four days. And so it's like, pick your own truth, live your own dream. And I was like, come on. Problem is, um, yesterday I wanted to mow. And it uh, didn't matter. didn't matter what, what weather app I went to. I couldn't get it not to rain. Yesterday, and I was confronted by this truth that, we find in our society from time to time that it, 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 it's neat to say, pick your own truth, but often you then run into the real truth. <laughs> and, you know, it can't rain and not rain no matter what you dream of for tomorrow. It's either going to rain or not rain. It's impossible for your truth and my truth to be true if they're both different. And when it comes to our life, this is pretty important. Because if I have a totally wrong idea of what's true, I'm going to make decisions that don't actually work in the real world. But if I do know what is true, I can actually find my way through life, and hopefully, as we're talking about this year, to thriving. So, simple question. Do you want to know what's true? And do you want to make decisions that make your life better? <laughs> Today, three big things from John 8 that move us down the road towards practically knowing and living the truth. A little spoiler alert, Jesus is going to say he is the key to both of those things. But three big ideas from John 8 today. Number one, number one, Jesus equates himself in this passage with the Old Testament pillar of fire. And he offers his guidance to those who look to him. So I'll explain this, but... He equates himself in today's passage with the Old Testament pillar of fire and offers his guidance to those who look to him. Now, come along with me. Uh, you might say, Jeremy, I heard the passage read, there was no pillar of fire being read. And you're right. But again, we're trying to put ourselves in the shoes of the people who would have been in that situation when Jesus actually said this. And we know from a couple weeks ago that at this time, the reason Jesus is in Jerusalem is the celebration of the Feast of Tabernacles. And the Feast of Tabernacles was a national one-week camping holiday where the whole country camped. People came to Jerusalem and camped. And it was a time of looking back to when God delivered the nation of Israel from Egypt to the Promised Land through the wilderness. They camped in the wilderness for 40 years. So they're remembering how God provided in the wilderness. And they're looking forward to God's ultimate provision in eternity. You know, that Old Testament promised land or the land around the nation of Israel today, it's just, a, it's just a picture, it's just a taste of the long-term eternal provision that God has for us, which is beyond what we can imagine with our minds. So the Feast of Tabernacles remembers this providing God and looks forward with hope to the future. And so you remember some of these stories we've walked through, that while they were in the wilderness in the Old Testament, Scripture says that they were provided with manna day by day. They would wake up and there would be some kind of a honey-ish, bread-ish, you know, cereal-ish thing on the ground in time for breakfast, and they would gather it and eat it. And then Jesus comes, and in the wilderness, while he's teaching people and they're hungry, he takes five loaves and three fish, and he multiplies it to feed 
thousands of people. But he doesn't stop at just this amazing miracle. He also goes on to say, what does he say? I am the bread of heaven. (laughs) So the manna was cool, but that wasn't really what it's all about. I am, I am, Jesus says, the great provision of God, satisfying the deepest parts of your soul. And then a couple weeks ago, we talked about how they had this water ceremony. So the Feast of Tabernacles was in September, October. It was after the harvest of the olives and the grapes, but it was after a time of drought. And so they would have this water ceremony where the priest would go out, procession behind him, people singing, get water from the spring, bring it up, pour it on the altar. And it was in this place that there was this metaphor for the Holy Spirit that was understood that as God provided water in the wilderness, back in the day for Israel, Moses hits the rock, water comes out, so God will pour out His Holy Spirit in the future. And then what does Jesus say? On all those things that the Jews were celebrating, He said, let anyone who is thirsty come to Me and drink. But another reality of September October is that this was celebrated around the fall equinox, And this is the time when days are getting shorter and the sun starts to die. And so not only manna and water were, you know, part of the celebration and camping, but also there was a light ceremony. You can read about the light ceremony that was done in ancient Judaism. It's in the Mishnah, which is sort of an ancient instruction book for their festivals and stuff. And one of the the things they would do is pretty cool when you try try to picture yourself in a city, the city of Jerusalem, 2,000 years ago, there was no electricity or public lighting in that time, just to say. And the way Jerusalem is situated, Jerusalem is essentially on a hill, whichever direction you're coming from. It's up. And then the Temple Mount is on the up part of Jerusalem. And in the court, it's actually identified in this passage. It says Jesus was talking in the place where they would put the offerings. I don't know if you caught that. And that was called the Court of Women. And so the offerings were there. It was, it was an outdoor part. And they would do a lighting ceremony where they would build about 20-foot-high stands. So two stories up. Um, you know, picture like an ancient scaffolding of some kind. Four of them in this court during the Feast of Tabernacles. And on the top of these four stands, it's a pretty major structure, they would, on each stand, they would have four bowls made out of gold. <laughs> And these bowls were not very small. They were very big. They were 20-gallon bowls. It's about the size of like an average-sized Santa Claus's midriff, okay? It's about, it's like about like that. But five, maybe you have a five-gallon bucket in your garage, it's four of those. You know, it's a pretty big bowl, gold, hammered gold, 20 feet in the air, 16 of them at a high place in the city. And then they would make wicks, and they would turn these into massive lamps. And um, I said to somebody after the first service, they would actually, I, I didn't mention this in the first service because I think you guys can handle this and they couldn't. Um, they would make the wicks out of um, the used priest's underwear. I mean, that's just what they did. But, and I don't, I'm still trying to figure out the theological significance and I don't know what it is. Well, I thought you could handle that at 11, 11.30. And, and the, these wicks would burn up on the Temple Mount, up on the top of Jerusalem. And this might be an exaggeration, but historians would say there's essentially no dark spots in Jerusalem for this week. Why did they do that? <laughs> because in Exodus 13, we read that when God led Israel through the wilderness, He led them. His, his presence was tangible with them. During the day, it looked like a pillar of cloud. And during the night, it looked like a blazing pillar of fire. So sometimes He would even move them along in the night behind His presence, behind this glory. And so all week, as they're remembering their camping, they're remembering what would have happened, you know, before that time. They would have been in their tents in the wilderness, and the blazing pillar of fire was out there. <laughs> and they lit this thing in Jerusalem to remember that amazing expression of the presence of God. And so that backstory really helps when you come in and read one simple verse at the, day, uh, at the beginning of today's passage. That's the space. Jesus is in that courtyard. With that light, with that backstory, with the man of the water, all the things they're celebrating, the tents, the camping, and what does he say? I'm the bread of heaven. I am the water of life. He says now today, I am the light of the world. 
Whoever follows me will never walk in darkness, but will have the light of life. Jesus is not just saying wimpy, shallow stuff like, i got some great ideas to help you out a little bit. With that backstory, he's saying, I am the light. It's me, and not just of a nation in the wilderness hundreds of years ago, as amazing as that was. I am the light of the world. And if you follow me, you will have the light of life. Just like you will have your own little pillar of fire. (laughs) Where you can look out, even in the darkness, and you can see what life is really like. And you can walk without pain. (laughs) There is this connection between truth and thriving. It's called in the New Testament, walking in the light. To actually see what's out there and being able to walk and live fruitfully in it. It reminded me, uh, in my growing up years, I went to this camp, this Bible camp. And at the high school level at this camp, there was always this uh, game on one of the last nights, this late night game, and it's probably at every camp, I don't know. But on the, the, the last night or the second night, last night, after the sun went down, after the campfire, after supper, after all the last things, they'd have this final big game. And the game was all the counselors went and hid. And they would assign a point value to each counselor based on how difficult their hiding spot would be. And you know, some would just stand in the shadow of the chapel and you get 100 points for finding them. Someone hide in more difficult places. One of my years, this one guy, I think it was a 10,000 point guy, he went and laid in the shallow part of the lake with a straw and just breathed for three hours and nobody found him. But you would have got a lot of points if you did. <laughs> But the key to this game, you know, you're going through woods and around buildings and it's pitch black and you're trying to find people hiding in the darkness. The key to that game really happened a week before when you were packing. (laughs) And you had to remember, if you knew the camp and you knew the game, you had to remember your flashlight. You didn't really need your flashlight for the rest of the camp. You could find your way to the bathroom or the dining hall during the day without a flashlight. But for that game, if you wanted to win, you needed a flashlight. If you didn't have a flashlight... You're running through the woods, you're getting slapped by branches, you're tripping over a walk, you're rock, you're stepping in, you know, the shallow part of the leg. It's just miserable. But if you've got a flashlight, I mean, you're Navy SEAL. You're just going through, tapping off the counselors, and you're probably going to win, like, a hot dog or, you know, or something like that <laughs> because you really were forward thinking. But, you know, when you have the light, you can see what's actually out there. And Jesus says, I'm the light of the world. And if you follow me, you'll get it. And you will actually have a light for life. And so the question underneath this today for you is, what truth is guiding you? (laughs) And in the wisdom and perspective of Psalm 1, as we've been saying all year, you know, where are the roots of your life and your mind and your heart going into? Where are you drawing up your sense of what is real and how life is best? live? Maybe a more personal question, more practical question. Where and how do you wish you could see more clearly in this world? Jesus says, that's me. (laughs) I'm the pillar of fire. I will guide you. So how do we step into this truth? And this passage goes over a lot of things, reinforces, repeats a lot of things we've studied. So I'm not going to mention all of it. But there's a couple real key points in this passage where Jesus says something a little different, a little new, and he really is responding to that possible question, if we wanted to ask it. How do we actually step into the truth? He offers a a couple things, and I'll just give them away, and then I'll talk about them. But the first is to believe in him, and the second one is to follow him. (laughs) But there's some depth beneath that. So second, second here, in the next section, Jesus intensifies his claims to divinity, and challenges us to carefully consider our response. So he goes deeper. He's going to go deeper even next week, intensifying his claim, essentially saying, I am God himself. And he challenges us to carefully consider our response to it. Now, if you remember John 20, verse 31, sort of the the theme verse, the thesis verse of the whole book, the author, John, says, I'm writing these things. I'm writing this gospel. I'm showing you, he says three things. He says, I'm showing you the signs of what happened with Jesus, so that you will believe that he is the Son of God, 
and by believing that you may have life in his name. So I'm, uh, in his name. I'm showing you the signs so that you may believe that you may have eternal life. And so we've said that in John, it's like the author is bringing up all kinds of people to the witness box. To the witness box. And so there's all this talk. And again, the Pharisees go there. Again, the religious leaders, verse 13, uh, of sort of courtroom setting. He comes back. Here you are, appearing as your own witness. Your testimony is not valid. And Jesus has said a lot on that, but I just want to open this up to you. Verse 14. Jesus says, even if I testify on my own behalf, my testimony is valid. Because I know where I came from and where I am going. We talked about that a couple weeks ago. He says, but you have no idea where I come from or where I am going. You judge by human standards. And he goes on to say, I, you know, they said, your, your testimony is not valid because you have new, no witnesses. He says, well, the problem is you're judging by human standards. And I just want to invite you here into the humility that precedes belief in God. Now, I'm not saying people who believe in God are humbler than people who don't, because that's not always the truth. But I am saying if you want to enter into belief in God, you've got to start with humility. And what the religious leaders are essentially trying to do is they're saying, they're saying, hey, where are the people or where are the sources where you can prove, where is the evidence that, that you can prove? Who are the witnesses to prove that you are God? Well, the issue is, what do you do? Like, if you want to prove something... You, you, you kind of need to fully grasp it and get above it. <laughs> you know, if you want to be really good at chemistry, you've got to go to university and find somebody who is above chemistry, you know, and can explain it to you and draw in all the realities. But when it comes to figuring out who God is, which three humans, if they tell you somebody is God, does that kind of do the trick? Put them in the witness box. I think he's God. I think he's God. I think he's God. It doesn't matter. You can't get above God. And so in a really interesting way, in the, throughout the book of John, Jesus says, there are witnesses, but you're not accepting them because your perspective is human. He says, here's the witnesses, me, and he says in today's passage, i got another witness, the Father, John 14 to 16, he'll say, i got another witness, the Holy Spirit. <laughs> and you might say, well, that's circular reasoning. And, you know, theologians would say, well, you're right, but what are you going to do? <laughs> How are you going to prove who God is? And, and this is much of what our world is stuck in. And we can be stuck in this. is trying to prove our way towards God. I can't believe there is God. I can't believe He exists. I can't believe Christian perspective because I can't prove it. But Jesus says it's because you're trying to prove something from a human perspective that you can't prove from a human perspective. And just as an interesting challenge to people who came to church on a Sunday morning, all the people Jesus is talking to in this passage are religious. <laughs> These are the people that Jesus says ultimately are blinded. Because this weird thing can happen to our humility when we get religious that we can think we got God figured out. We can stop searching. We can stop humbling ourselves and opening our hearts to who God really is. It's just an encouragement to you today. Those who are good at religion <laughs> stay in a place of humility. Keep searching. Keep opening their hearts. Jesus intensifies his claim to divinity, and he challenges us to carefully consider our response. And there's this first of two key verses we run into in verse 24. How do we, how do we step into the truth? You know, if you want to see the world as it is and live in a way that works, how do we do this? Well, it has to do with Jesus and about believing in Him and following Him. So look at verse 24 with me. It's a really interesting moment here. Jesus says, uh, "You are." this is verse 23, You are from below. I am from above. You are of this world. I am not of this world. By the way, some people will say, Jesus never really claimed to be God. Read John. But He says it pretty clearly. But then He says this, verse 24, I told you that you would die in your sins... If you do not believe that I am He, you will indeed die in your sins. Jesus intensifies His claims and challenges us to be careful how we respond. If you do not believe that I am He, you will indeed die in your sins. Now, pronouns are supposed to go back to a noun, English students, right? 
you read this, if you do not believe that I am he, like, who's he? Who, who is the he that you are talking about? And what's interesting is, in the original manuscript, commentators say the NIV actually doesn't translate this too well, because the pronoun actually isn't there. This is what it actually says in the Greek. If you do not believe that I am, you will indeed die in your sins. And you probably don't need a terribly deep understanding of Scripture to know what those words I am go back to. In John 7, or in John, seven times, Jesus will say, I am something. I'm the bread of heaven. I'm the light of the world. Seven other times, he'll just say, I am. This is one of them. And that goes back to Moses, where Moses is in front of the burning bush, and Moses says, who should I tell them sent me to deliver Egypt? And God says, tell them, I am. <laughs> That's my name. I am the, exi- I'm the essence of existence. He said, you could translate it, I will be who I will be. You know, God calls himself, I am. And Jesus says, listen to this, if you do not believe I am, you will die in your sins. I, I am the essence of life. I am the essence of existence. I am. And if you don't believe that, then, you, you know, you may go well on living for a number of years, but the time's going to come where you will die and you will still be in your sin because you do not believe that I am. He intensifies his claim. And he challenges us to recognize that our very life is on the line with our response. How do we step into truth? Number one, we believe. (laughs) We believe. We approach God with humility, with a true openness of heart, and we ultimately see God in Jesus and we believe. I was reminded of a story uh, from the history of my family. Many decades ago, there was a young lady named my grandma. I think she had a different name, but I mean, yeah, that's what I called her. Named my grandma. She was single, and she was hanging out with this guy and kind of wondering about if there's going to be a relationship here. And it's tough in old school North Dakota because it's like you're going to marry a guy, it's like that guy or that guy. I mean, there's not too many people there in that time, right? So she's with this guy, but she ultimately got to a place where he was not a believer, and she was following Jesus, and that was important to her and who she married. And so she told him, it's not going to work out with us. You're not a follower of Jesus, and, you know, faking following Jesus is not going to do the trick, so, you know, it's not going to happen. Well, they started hanging out again later as friends, and she invited him to some church meetings, a week of church meetings. And he was, you know, living the life. At the time, he was smoking two and a half packs of camels a day. That's the good stuff, I guess, back from the 1850s or whenever this happened. Two and a half packs a day. It was after the 1850s, guys. That was a pretty poor joke. But he went to this week of of meetings, and by the second night, my dad said he was like a caged animal as he listened to the message. Not because he was angry, but because belief had welled up in his heart, and he so wanted to respond to the message. And so as the meeting came to an end, You know, he was brought there probably because she was pretty, but his heart was opened. He went to the front, gave his life to Jesus Christ. On the way home, he threw his cigarettes in the garbage, never smoked another one in his life, and then became my grandpa. You know, that's how stories sort of end. But something happened, you know, and it's not like a story teaches all the practical application, but for whatever kind of mixed bag of motives, he kept stepping forward. He kept trying that next thing out. And maybe it was to get the girl at the beginning. (laughs) But ultimately, belief rose up in his heart and he surrendered his life to Jesus Christ. He believed. And he followed him for the rest of his life. Jesus made huge claims about himself. You're missing them (laughs) if you don't see them there. And then he went on to change the course of human history. Who do you think he is? And this is the question of our lives. How are you responding to who you think he is? How do we step into this truth? We believe, and secondly, we follow. And this verse, the, the, the passage takes us to an interesting next key verse. What does it look like to actually follow him? What is, what, what is the truth, and how do we live it? Third, we'll talk around this, but Jesus says that when he is lifted up, We'll see clearly who he is and what it means to follow him. So come along with me in this. Jesus says when he's lifted up, we will see clearly who he is and what it means to follow him. So Jesus says, I'm the light of the world. 
And if you follow me, you'll have the light of life. You'll be able to see, make good decisions, move towards thriving. And then Jesus calls people to believe. I am the Son of God. And you believing that is really important so that you don't die for your sins. But let's say you do believe. What do you do with that? And the simple answer of Jesus' ministry is follow. Jesus says when he's lifted up, we'll see clearly who he is and what it means to follow him. So verse 28 is the second key verse here. Verse 28. They did not understand (laughs) all this. Jesus says, when you have lifted up the Son of Man... Then you will know that I am He, and that I do nothing on my own, but speak just what the Father has taught me. The one who sent me is with me. He has not left me alone, for I always do what pleases Him. When you have lifted up the Son of Man, then you will know that I am He. Guess what? That He's not in that verse either. (laughs) He's saying in this this passage, when you have when you have lifted me up, then you will know that I am. What is he talking about? Well, John, in an ironic and interesting way that still works in the English language, uses this idea of lifting up to mean two things. One, the crucifixion. That Jesus is physically lifted up by his enemies, nailed to the cross, defeated. But at the same time that as he is humiliated, he is also lifted up spiritually by God the Father, glorified, exalted, winning the victory of the day. So John will talk about this all the time, that through Jesus' suffering, he was glorified. Through his humiliation, he was exalted. It shouldn't surprise us because Scripture keeps saying, humble yourself in the sight of the Lord and you will be lifted up. But Jesus is saying, When you, as my enemies, lift me up, crucified, then you will know that I am, and you will see that I only talk and do what comes from the Father. Powerful verse. Because there is such a simplicity in what it looks like to respond and take the next steps of belief in Jesus Christ. The cross does two things. Number one, It shows us clearly who God is. There's all kinds of false religions that have all kinds of false ideas about who God is. But the cross is the clearest picture of who God is. This is who God is. He is love. He is one who is willing to be killed by his enemies for his enemies. It's a very good story. This is the true and disarming and humbling and challenging and burning truth. This is the holiness of God. This is the righteousness of God. This is the love of God. It's God on the cross. God was in Christ dying for the sins of the people who were killing him. When Jesus is lifted up, we see the love of God and we see the power of God. At his moment where it looked like the greatest defeat and the greatest surrender, it was his greatest victory. That's when he beat sin and death. This is who God is. At his weakest, he's still stronger than everything we need. And it also shows us clearly how to follow Jesus. Then you will see when I'm lifted up, you will see that I speak and do what God does. (laughs) This is our call. How do you follow Jesus? When you believe, how do you follow? Well, look, read the whole thing, and there's a lot of details. But coming up to the top in a simple way, it has to do with living the cross. Day in, day out, moment in, moment out, sacrificial and active love for God and other people, even our enemies. Putting others first. That's it. (laughs) I mean, the rest is details, and they're important details, but... Lay down your life, take up your cross, follow Jesus sacrificially in a way that hurts you. Love God and love other people, even people who are totally against you. Jesus says in Luke 9, whoever wants to be my disciple must deny themselves and take up their cross daily and follow me. And this is what I love about our theme for this year. Because when you put on a poster, how to thrive, and there's this really juicy tree, we all get really selfish in our hearts. I want good stuff in my life. And let me tell you, God wants good stuff in your life, but this is how he tells you to get it. 
Follow him. <laughs> Believe in him. Follow him. He says after that verse, take up your cross. He says, because here's the thing. If you try your whole life to just save your life, you will lose it. If you're self-focused and it's about you and your kingdom and your stuff and what you hope for your dreams, and frankly summarize just everything our culture tells you you need to do to find fulfillment, if that's what you do, you'll lose your life. But if you lay down your life for Jesus and for the gospel, for people, if you live a life of sacrificial love for God and others, then you will find real life. You will actually discover what you were put on earth for. This is the ethic of the cross. This is the Jesus ethic. The cross shows us who God is, and it shows you in a remarkably simple way what you should do in every situation. Live the cross. (laughs) Put God first. Before your feelings, before the obstacles, before your reservations, put God first. And put the person across from you first. Probably we need to add, put the people across the world first. <laughs> Live lives of sacrificial love. And in small, medium, large, and supersized ways, we can apply this. We can apply this. Uh, just a few days ago, I went downstairs. Uh, Crystal said, can you go down and grab the lettuce from the basement fridge? I said, sure. She was making a salad. Of course I'm going to grab it. So I go and grab it. And while I'm down there, I yelled up, do you need the cabbage too? And she said, no, just the lettuce. So I brought the lettuce out. And then after I got up all 12 stairs, she said, actually, I need the cabbage too. So what do you think I did? I grabbed the cabbage. I came up yelling, drop kicked it into our ceiling fan, and it splintered all over. The, it was a, I didn't do No, I gave it to her because it was a beautiful opportunity for me to lay down my life for my wife. And it resulted in a thriving coleslaw. <laughs> But we have these opportunities. What are you going to do? I told you. I asked you if I needed the cabbage. What are you... You know, no. What an opportunity. Two times in five minutes, I had the opportunity to sacrificially serve my wife, husband. Step up. This is good stuff. But medium ways, too. Like, have you ever been hurt in a relationship? (laughs) Of course you have. Have you ever been hurt in a relationship? You know... What do you do? How do you respond? Mass email to all your friends about how that person was wrong. Some people have done that. Don't do that. What do we do? We, we channel our Jesus, right? It's like, imagine yourself on the cross, bleeding. Probably a good metaphor for being hurt sometimes. Strung up on a cross by your friends, your former friends. And then what do you do? What does Jesus do? Yeah, I'm being killed by you, but I'm willing to be killed for you. Father, forgive them. Like, they don't know how broken what they're doing is. He loves. Large ways in our lives, you know, like, what direction am I going with my life? Who am I going to marry? What kind of work will I do? What kind of friends am I going to be with? You know, what kind of neighbor am I going to be? How am I going to spend my money? Should I buy that house or that house? That car or that car? What am I going to do with my life? You know, and so the call is that in every moment we recognize God, two things. God's right on our life. That God gets to tell me how to live. He's allowed to. And praise be to God, He doesn't just squash me with His finger like we do with ants, you know? He actually wants me to survive and even to thrive. So we recognize His right on our life and we joyfully thank Him that the counterintuitive truth of the Gospel is true. And we live into it that by laying down my life for God, for others, for the gospel, that's where I find real life. By serving, I find greatness. Another beautiful side feature of this is the ground starts to feel extremely level (laughs) between us and the worst sinners we can think of. Have you matured to the place where day by day you sacrificially and actively lay down your life for God and other people? And so one of the New Testament writers says, well, you haven't yet matured enough to be shedding blood. So keep going. Go deeper. Grow more. Take on another level. There's so much room to grow. Jesus is the pillar of fire. He's the truth. He shines the way. He says, believe in me. And he says, follow me. And we come to this place where we're like, Wow, 
Am I going to do that? But beautifully, at the end of today's chunk, we read verse 30, even as he spoke, many people believed in him. For me, and I don't know how it lands with you, but for me, there's just something increasingly right about how the gospel lands on my heart. It's not what I want it to be. I want the gospel to be, you know, if you buy the ticket and pray the prayer, you'll win the 50-50, right? That's what I want. But when I really deeply reflect and really open my heart, my heart goes, yeah, it's got to be right. It's got to be right that for heaven to go forever and be good, everybody's got to be living for the leader and for everybody else. I mean, it just makes sense, right? <laughs> it's hard to say yes to it, but day by day, you know, we ask God, God, give me your kind of heart. Help me to see the world how you see it. Give me a willingness, give me a strength to actually surrender and sacrifice my life for other people, to serve, and in laying down my life to find true life. So this is the life I encourage you towards today. Three on-ramps as we land. First of all, know Jesus. Oh man, there's so many people in our society who have a lot to say about Jesus. A lot of people in the church say a lot of things about Jesus. <laughs> Some of them are true, but, you know, read the Bible. Find out about who Jesus actually is. Read it every day. Second, don't just read the Bible. Do the Bible. Invite Jesus to teach and guide you in your daily life. And third, follow Jesus today, this afternoon, right now, by putting God and others before yourself. What a revolutionary change that brings when a person decides to live differently. Next week, we'll keep going in John 8. We're going to respond in a song of worship. Would you stand? And I want to pray. And just, I want to say, as we respond in worship, you can stand. Um, sing the song if your heart is aligned. <laughs> but tell God in your heart. Ask Him for the help. Tell Him who you want to be. Ask Him for His strength to live the life, to take you to that next step of maturity. So Jesus, we pray that together as a community. Teach us the Jesus ethic, the Jesus way, the way of the cross. The way of suffering that leads to being lifted up. <laughs> that in, in our pain, God, there can be glory. We want to lay it down in a fresh way for you, for our friends, family, and neighbors, for your kingdom, because your kingdom lasts, God. May we be those who do not shrink away, but who persist and persevere with your help, God, and find the life that is truly life. We pray it in Jesus' name.